good afternoon, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I think we are one degree of separation from lunch, so I'm trying to keep it <laughs> funny and nice, so you are, are awake with me the last, you know, last speech. So my name is Marina Tognetti, and I'm a tech entrepreneur. I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Mingle.com, which is a global online school where you use the best teacher combined with technology to give training in languages, team building, and soft skills training. I believe tech entrepreneurship is the ultimate challenge. If we can make it there, we can make it anywhere. So today, I'm going here so you can see me, I'm going to talk about risk and entrepreneurship. Why? Because I believe that women have a different perception of risk, and that's one of the reasons why we don't participate in tech entrepreneurship yes. sufficiently. Yes. I would have liked to have it full screen, but we go with this. Oh. 5%. Only 5% of tech startups are owned by women. Keep in mind, 95% are owned by men. So technology is revolutionizing every part of our society, and yet we do not participate to the revolution in sufficient numbers. So uh, yeah, that goes in the learn how to use this thing. Huh? Yeah. yeah, we got it. So the question is why, and especially what can we do about it? And I want to go back to what can we do ourselves that we can control instead of waiting for all, you know, society of uh, political changes or business changes which is outside of our control. I think the, the question, oh, I'm still again. I think the question is in risk. 90% of tech startups fail. Keep in mind, 90%. If you're a first time tech startup entrepreneur, you have more than, ten, less than 10% chance of succeeding. So it actually means that if you are a tech entrepreneur, you know that the odds are against you. The majority of tech entrepreneurs do not manage. The majority of the tech entrepreneurs fail, go bankrupt, uh, lose the company normally within three years of start of the company. So you can imagine that if a woman goes into technology and think of, I'm going to try entrepreneurship, and you see those odds, you see, yeah, nine out of 10 are going to fail. You have to be overconfident to, you, to believe that you are the one woman out of 10 that can make it, one person out of 10 actually that can make it. So I believe that the problem is that normally women tend to have a more risk adverse perception. And that's why they start less businesses, they play less in the stock exchange, they take less risky behavior. Men are more response. So when they see the statistics, men, what do they think? Yeah, I'm the 10% that can make it, so I'm going to go entrepreneurship. So we need to change this, these statistics. Now let's get it right. And how? The problem is the way we perceive risk. So when we talk about risk and entrepreneurship, majority of people think over, oh, what is risk? It's wild risk taking. It's completely uncontrollable risk. So when people think about entrepreneurship, when I ask people over, what do you think is risk taking means? They start getting these uh, images like gambling, uh, yeah, their devil, uh, wild people taking risks that uh, definitely bring you to a, a bad outcome. This is not correct. Entrepreneurship is not wild risk taking. Entrepreneurship is control risk. Successful entrepreneurs know how and when to control risk. Successful entrepreneurs have taken different steps in order to reduce risk, to control risk, to make a risk to the minimal possible level of risk so that they reduce the chance to, to be in the 90%. So this is actually very important to keep in mind because if we know that we as women are worried about the, you know, the chance of risks, but you keep in mind we can control risk, that's also when you have the opportunity to say, I can be in the 10%. One important thing, risk taking is not a threat, it's a process. That means it can be learned. I want to repeat it because it's very important. This is what against what most people think. It's not a threat. You're not born a risk taker. You learn how to be a risk taker. You learn how to be an entrepreneur. You learn how to be successful and to eliminate the chances of fail. And this is very important because when you go into entrepreneurship, you have to go with the mindset, I know what steps to take in order to be successful. So now I'm going to tell you the question is, how do you do it? So how, how do you learn the process? How do you control risk? Now, we start with something that I always like to start from the theory and then give some application how I did it myself. So if you start about the theory, I took some theoretical model that you already know. And I took a model that I call, this is the, the simple model, it's called comfort, stretch, and panic zone. Normally, it's used for a way of people on how to manage change or how to understand change or how to handle change. What the model says, it says people normally, when they are in the comfort zone, 
They are in the place where they know what to do. They have done it before, it's easy for them, it's within their area of control. This scheme can also be applied to entrepreneurship. So I say, when you are in the comfort zone, you are in the area of none, it's easy. So, but what you normally say when you are in the comfort zone, you don't learn, you don't stretch yourself. When you move outside of what you know how to do, you enter the stretch zone, meaning there is something you don't know how to do, there is something that is beyond your control, and it can be closer or further. So there are two types of stretch. There is the stretch where you know how to handle it, you can learn how to handle it, and there's what I call the panic zone. The biggest difference if you talk about entrepreneurship is when you are in the stretch zone, you are in a zone that I like to say the control risk. So you're in an area where you actually control the variable or risk. So yes, you're taking risk, but you know how to handle it. If you push it further, you are in a situation where it's uncontrollable risk. And that's where people panic. That's where you don't know what to do. That's when you decide altogether to give up and stop with entrepreneurship, or that's when you fail. So this model exists, and I like to apply to entrepreneurship. Then I went for myself, so I did it backwards. I first execute my startup, and then I, I thought, what is the theory behind it? So I'm developing right now, it's a kind of premiere, I'm developing my model that has helped me assessing how to, uh, to work with this one. And I call it the threshold model. So what I say is every threshold, so when you go from comfort zone to stretch zone or to, to stress zone, you actually have a threshold that you pass from one moment to the other. The threshold depends on three unique factors. So there are three factors for each one of us that determine where you stand. And each one of them is different, so each of the three factors is different. <coughs> Which one are the factors? So I went understanding a lot, reading a lot about theory of entrepreneurship and what it means to take risk and what it means to be a successful entrepreneur. And I identified three facts that drive risk, determination, assessment, and therefore success as entrepreneur. Mindset, skill, situation. What it means is that there is a component, a mix of the three that determine the personality of an entrepreneur. Mindset is obvious, you know. Mindset determines your acceptance of risk, your willingness to take risk, which could be more or less. Skills determine what you know how to do or what you don't know how to do. So determine your capability to handle risk. The more you know how to do, the more experience you have, the more risk you can handle. Situation means complexity of the startup or the company you're starting which means the more complex the situation, the more difficult it is for you. All three factors combined together gives you the situation in which you are now. So all three factors give the amount of risk or the possibility of success you have as an entrepreneur. The important thing is that what you can see, each one of them influence each other. So you have an area in the middle. The area in the middle is when you have the right mindset, the right skills, and you are in an easy situation with not real, real risk. That's when you are doing a job that you know how to do or doing something that is already known. That's the comfort zone. It's exactly that. It can be bigger or small, but when all three align, you are in your comfort area. When you have an overlapping of one or two variables, when you have one or the two variables, means there is something you know how to do and something else you don't. So that is, for me, identified like the stretch zone. It means I can handle it. I have the skills to do it. I'm not ready yet, but I have some skills. I can handle it. So it could be overlapping or two. Hey, I want to be an entrepreneur. I have the skills to be an entrepreneur, only it's a dumb, difficult startup. Let me try to do it. So whenever you have a crossing, it means you have one skill of two, two, one of the things of two. It could also be you only have one of them. It's like, you know, I dumb believe in my capability of entrepreneurship. My mindset is strong like hell. I'm going to make it. I'm going to learn whatever it takes. I'm going to put whatever effort it takes to be beating the situation, beating the skills. So whenever you have at least one, you are in a stretch zone, meaning you can leverage one of your capability or one of your uh, skills of the system in order to make it. When you are out, I don't need to explain, you are completely in panic zone. It also means you must be crazy because you don't have the right mindset, you don't have the right skills. The complex situation will make it also impossible. It's like, don't go there. This is the area where you just stay out. Don't go in a situation where you don't possess any one of those three that can help you making it a success. So this is how I'm developing this framework now, and, and, and as you speak along, so I'm developing really into a quantitative framework, but I want now to go a bit in practice what it meant for my startup. So when you go in practice, it's like, I will take only one example. You go in practice, you say, okay, where, where do you start? I think this is where to start it with the situation, because you know, it's objective, it's the type of company you are in. Now, if you go to the situation, it means, so when you want to move from one place to the other, you want to move from comfort zone to stretch zone. 
the best possible thing is that you have the biggest possible stretch zone. Because it means in the stretch zone, you can operate. You can be successful. So if you are in the stretch zone, your task is to make as big as possible, to move the, the threshold as far as possible so that you can move there, not go outside of that. So how do we do it? Start thinking about the situation. Why? Because it's really the startup you have in, in front of you. What can you do? Now, situation. The best thing you can do when you start a company, here I'm referring to tech company, but it can apply to any entrepreneurship, is you have to understand what are the sources of risk in your startup. And those sources of risk need to be reduced or eliminated. So you go and understand, OK, what is difficult about my startup? Of course, if you start something in artificial intelligence, you know nothing about technology, sorry, don't even go there. But you have to assess what are the difficult difficulties in my startup, what are the sources of risk in my startup. Number one, the number one reason why startups fail is lack of product market fit. What does it mean? You have a product that doesn't satisfy a specific customer need. Or you have a customer need that wants a different type of product. And the problem here is that entrepreneurs tend to fall in love with their idea. And it's everyone. I had it myself. So you have an idea. You think it's brilliant. You think that everybody thinks the same. And you want that idea to succeed. You don't look at who is buying it, who, who needs it. Just see, oh, this thing, somebody else must want it. We were in the situation. So I've launched my company as a marketplace. Uh, I came from eBay, so my last, uh, last job before I found my company, I was a director at eBay. So I thought, oh, I know how marketplaces work. I'm going to create a marketplace for services, for learning languages. I love the concept. We launched, we received funding. Even before launching the company, we already have VC investments. We got awards, PR, we won uh, you know, innovation awards, uh, European Venture uh, Awards, Benelux Venture Awards. Everybody literally in Holland was talking about us 15 years ago. We were like you know, the hot company in the Netherlands. So we're like, cool, everybody likes my product. No one was buying it. So it was like one of those things where everybody likes it. I used to say bad, bad jokes among the women, like the women that everybody likes, no one wants to marry. Yeah. And I was this kind of startup that everybody wants it, but no one wanted to put money in it. Everybody talked, this is the coolest thing. We had all these you know, people talking about us, but you know, put the money and buy lessons, buy language lessons. So the first thing I had to admit for myself is I love my, my idea. I thought it was brilliant. You know, the judges thought I was winning all this prize. It was brilliant, but something was fundamentally wrong. So I called my team back, and we we're spending a lot of money. So what we are doing, we we're spending so much money. We we're spending 30, 40,000 euros in Google every single month. So we are, you know, we, we burn one million funding in less than one year. So I was like, wow, this something is wrong. So I called the team and say, stop everything. Just whatever you're doing, stop back. Come back to me. Let's think about it. So I put the team and I say, let's go out in the market and understand what the problem is. Let's understand product market fit. Let's understand our customer. We start interviewing students, start interviewing teachers. We start interviewing similar industry. Learning languages is not a funny thing. You don't learn languages in one go. It takes long. So we went to the diet industry. We went to the training industry. All the industries that have similar problems. When there, we say, OK, what is the problem? Why are the people not buying the lesson? And the answer was always the same. They were telling us, it's different than eBay. If I'm buying a laptop on eBay, I know if it's good or bad. If the laptop works, it's good. If the laptop arrives in time, it's good. But with language lesson, how can I assess the judge and judge the value of a teacher? I'm not capable. A friendly teacher, a funny teacher, is not necessarily a teacher who can teach. And they were also telling me, I will only know if I made a, a bad purchase decision months later, because I will find out I've learned anything, nothing. And my problem is not even putting money. I've wasted six months of my time. I wasted my trust that I can make it, which goes back to you know, the same of a believing you can do it. And I realized I choose the wrong teacher. So if you know it's market-based work, where you know, it's a perfect balance of demand and supply, meet each other, and you know, the, the, the platform stays out of any judgment. You, know, you put feedback, but it's subjective. What the company was asking is, you have to judge the value of the teacher. You have to give me credibility and trust that whatever I choose is good. So we went back to the drawing board. We said, it must be completely different. Let's go to high quality platform. Every teacher must certify, judge, train by us. So we go out in the market, we say, we're not a platform. We're a school. Whichever teacher you choose is perfect, is good. You just choose the teacher you like personally. 
So that actually started working. Then people started buying. I was like, wow, that's good. I have the right product. And suddenly people were asking for invoices. I was like, why are people asking for invoices? I was like, OK, but if they ask for invoice, they're making a cost declaration, which means it's a business customer. So now all the people who are coming are businesses are not consumer. A marketplace work for a consumer. So I went back and said, I think that our product market is businesses to a school and not consumer to a platform. So I went back and said, now we have it, but now we have to build a different product because we are not talking to consumers anymore. So we did the third step, and that is build the product. And here I, I shorten it up. This is in tech terminology means build a minimum viable product. What does it mean, build a minimum viable product? Don't go out and build the total platform and the service, etc. You don't know if the user needs that. You know, how do you know? It's in your mind. You know, the user is the only one that knows. So instead of going out, building it all, and then finding out that three quarters is useless, we went and went to our customer. Actually, our first customer, who is still with us, we went there, and I kind of bluff. I went there and I say, OK, you know, do you want to, this product? Yeah, of course. And then I say, OK, what do you need from us for your perfect product? Say, yeah, I want an account manager. I want an assessment at the beginning. I want an assessment afterwards. I want reporting every month. I want reporting in real time. I want this, I want this, I want Yeah, of course we have it. So I went back. I took one of my marketing guys. I said, Stefano, you are the account manager. And so he went back and he started doing everything manually. We literally did manually. Reporting, we did an Excel at the end of the month. We sent it like it was automatic and reporting. No way. We're like, my whole team was just summing up all the data to put it together. Assessment, we just called the teacher in and said, guys, you have to make an assessment. We made the format, hand, handmade the format that the teacher needed to fill in. So what we did, we did the product that was 100% built around the customer need. I didn't invent it. My customer asked me. And so that's another important lesson. When you want the perfect product market fit, you have to understand who is customer, but you have to do exactly what your customer need. So this was lesson number one. And that I would say whenever you start, and especially if you are in tech startup, but entrepreneurship, always start with the situation, with the complexity of the company. This is the first question you need to ask. Second question I was like, yeah, now I need to have the right skills to manage a startup. And I wanted to build a global multinational. And you know, I had this idea of Silicon Valley, the billionaires, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, those things. So I was like, OK, what do I need to have as a skill to run one day in my big company? I was, keep in mind, I was a completely inexperienced entrepreneur. I had 18 years of experience as corporate director, which is totally different. Nothing I did prepared me to be an entrepreneur. So I went back and I say, OK, what is skill number one? Skill number one, you need to be entrepreneur, financial skills. It's always understated. People are too optimistic. You need to know down well all your financial in details. You need to understand your cash flow. You need to understand your profit and loss. You need to understand every single voice of your financial. And I heard the financial presentation here. I'm sure they agree. So what, what goes on here? So one other thing that I notice is when we start spending, we spend two million in two years. You know, and then the funding start running out. It's like, you know, my investors were like, Wait a moment, you know, I'm not going to give you another million to spend. You first have to do it right. So the first thing you have to see is look way far ahead. One important thing is that many entrepreneurs, why do the 90% fail? Because they realize, I have no money next month. I'm going to go broke. And when you have a team, I like 30 people in the team. Yeah, it's easy. Eh? You spend 100,000 per month. In two months, you go broke. You have to look way ahead, almost one year ahead. You have to recognize the problem before it arrives. So how do you recognize the problem? You need to understand your financial. So go back, get an Excel, go down in your PS. I'm sure you understand, you agree. Go back in your PL, write your PL, the cost, every single cost you have to write it down. Profit and loss is important. Put it aside, cash flow. Cash flow is the only thing that counts for a startup. Because at the end of the game, it's not how much you have in the bottom line, how much money you have in your bank account to pay your cost. So I went down, I draw it, I really had a huge Excel with all the, you know, the different category. I went down and I created for every voice. I put also a note over, can I reduce it? Can I uh, decrease it? Or can I do anything with it? So the last one is, I'm almost done. You have to take action. So once you have identified your PNL, you actually have to cut cost. So what we did, we started uh, moving everything offshore. All our customer support went offshore. Programming went offshore. You cut significantly cost. Uh, our server, we, uh, we optimize the server. We negotiated with every single supplier. I cut out all these beautiful lunches and branches and things we're doing to be a cool startup. 
Sorry, not now. First we have to survive, and then we'll do the cool stuff. So you have to be hard. I fire people. I fire a lot of people because I just say, I'm sorry, I cannot afford you now. I, either I fire a part of my team, or we're all broke in three months. So I went down, and I really remember we had the farewell with some people that were fired. And they really, they, they, they put the glass up, and they say, I cheer to you. I hope you're going to make it, because you deserve it. So they really, truly understand it's a choice between sacrificing a few for the, the good of the all. Last thing is change mindset. I'm sorry I'm going a, a bit of above time, but yeah, it's the last one. Change mindset. It's very important. The good part is that you can change your mindset simply by going out of your comfort zone. You learn how to change your mindset. And here I'm going to say only one tip about changing your mindset. The biggest barrier for entrepreneurs is the fear of failure, which is right, you know, 90% fail. You have to ask yourself one important question. So what happened to me when I had the negative side, I was scared, you know, am I going to go bankrupt? I also went to a psychologist, and I, like, I was terrified. And the psychologist asked me, what are you afraid about? I said, I'm going to go bankrupt. OK, what's going to happen if you go bankrupt? Yeah, I'm going to lose everything, the company. And he say, are you going to end up on street? Don't you have money for a house for food? No, I have some reserves. Are your, is your boyfriend going to leave you, your, your uh, family, your friends? You know, they care about me. So what are you afraid about? Yeah, what about people think? Which people, your friends, family? No, no, I don't care. They, they care about me, how I am. They know I'm not my company. Who? Yeah, people I don't know. <laughs> and so the psychology told me, so what you tell me that the worst thing can happen if you go bankrupt, because it's not sure you're going to be bankrupt, is that People you don't know, you don't care about, who don't give a shit about you, sorry for the word. <laughs> Those people might think that you are a failure, but believe me, they're busy with their life, they're not busy with thinking about you. So that's the biggest risk. So that's why I say, ask yourself, when you're scared, ask yourself, what's the worst that can happen? But truly, what's the worst that can happen? So this is, the, I think, what I would suggest in terms of uh, tips. And then one last tip is, do not compare yourself to anyone else. <laughs> yeah. Everyone, you have a different situation, different company, different mindset, different skills. Your situation is not the same. Elon Musk is Elon Musk. You're not Elon Musk. You're not me. You're no one else. You are yourself. Because those three ingredients, it's practical. They are different. No one of us has a combination of three that is the same. So my last thing is to say to you is, I want to influence and empower women to believe in technology and to believe to go in technology because I want that we change the 90% and especially the 5%. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Marina. Yeah. Question. <laughs> I think we have no time for questions, eh? Yeah. Correct. We have lunch break now. Ah, the light. There is light.